cover today. Um, just quick overview of what to expect from today. Um, first, I'm going to do a very, very quick recap of the lecture that you all watched um, from Sergey on testing and deployment. Um, and it's going to go by very, very fast. So if you did not do your homework, then um, I'm not sure that, uh, that, that this will bring you back up to speed. But that's, that's the intention. Um, and then I want to just check in briefly on projects um, and just kind of see how everyone is feeling about where they're at. We have you know, a week left in the class. Um, and so I want to get a sense of you know, how close to being done everyone feels. Um, and then we have two amazing guest speakers to, to kind of conclude this part of the class. All right, any questions before I get started? Great. Um, so just to briefly um, review the lecture that you watched from Sergey, um, he started by covering some concepts of testing and deployment. And so these concepts were kind of, you know, how to think about the, the entire structure of your machine learning project and how different tests fit into that. And then he covered this idea of the ML test score, um, which is a rubric from Google of how to think about how production ready your machine learning code base is. And then, he start, and then he talked about some of the infrastructure and tooling around this sort of part of uh, machine learning projects. So we talked about uh, continu continuous integration and testing, um, covered Docker in some depth, um, some ideas for deploying to the web, monitoring product, uh, prediction systems once they've been deployed, and then a little bit on kind of how to think about deploying um, not to the web, but to hardware or to mobile. And so I'll talk through a couple of the key so uh, slides from the talk. Um, the first that I really like is this, um, this kind of overview of machine learning systems. So you, know, you have your training system, um, and your training system is combined with your training and validation data to create a prediction system, which is then served um, into production. And the key concept here is the different types of tests that you might have for the different stages of, um, of this code base. So you have tests on your, on your training system, and this is things like you know, if you push some update to your code, is it, is it breaking your ability to achieve a certain score on your training set? And these are kind of longer tests that take, you know, maybe up to a data run. Then on your prediction system, you have validation sets. And these are, you know, testing regressions to your model itself. So if you push an update to your model, you want to make sure that it's still performing as well as it did before. And then functionality tests, which are quicker tests that can catch kind of um, making sure that you perform well on like really important examples or edge cases. And then finally, once you've deployed the system in, into production, you want to monitor it. So you want to make sure that you know, it doesn't go down, you don't have um, data shifts, and you don't have like, more errors than you're expecting to have. Um, this is a slide that covers some of what was talked about in the um, ML readiness score. And so it just talks about some of the different types of tests that you might want to have for your data set, your model, your infrastructure, and then you know, monitoring in production. Um, I won't go through all of these now, but these are just some things to think about as you're, as you're writing tests for your, your, um, your code base for the project. And then diving into testing and continuous integration, um, you know, there's a few concepts here. There's unit and integration tests. And so this is you know, testing individual parts of your code base um, to make sure that they continue to function when you change your code, and you know, possibly testing your entire system. Um, and then there's a concept of, of continuous integration. And all this means is that you know, every time that you push new code to your repo, let's say, um, before you deploy um, a new model into production, or sometimes even in some organizations before you merge that code into master, you want to, um, you want to run some tests to make sure that that code is not sort of broken what you were able to do before. There are a bunch of um, software as a service tools for continuous integration. Um, most of these are not, in fact, I think all of these are not specific to machine learning, um, but these are just some of the tools that you might experiment with. And then another core idea that Sergey talked about was containerization. Um, and so this is kind of a way of managing the dependencies of your code um, when you run it in a continuous integration or deployment setting. So that's kind of what was covered in testing. For deployment, um, a few concepts here. The first is a REST API. And so this is just a general um, API for HTTP systems. And so like, one way to think about deploying machine learning system is, is just treating them as kind of a black box that's called by a web server. You have a bunch of different options for deploying um, machine learning code into production. You can you know, put the code into a virtual machine, like a Docker container, and then you can um, scale it up to more users by adding instances to your, um, to your system. 
or you can do it via orchestration. And then the last concept that Sergey talked about um, that he really likes and I think is really exciting is serverless functions, where you don't actually have to manage your own, um, your own infrastructure at all. And the takeaways here were, you know, if you're doing inference on a CPU, then you can get away by um, you know, scaling, uh, just scaling up by launching more and more servers or by going serverless. And you, know, you don't really have to do anything too crazy here. Um, Sergey's, Sergey's dream, um, which I think would be really cool, is just you know, deploying Docker as easily as deploying Lambda. Um, but the next best thing is you know, either using Lambda and dealing with the fact that the, um, the form that you have to get your model into is much trickier, or using Docker. Um, and it just kind of depends on what you need for your model and what your priorities are, which um, side of the trade-off you land on. If you're doing GPU inference, then this becomes more tricky. And um, there are you know, more specialized tools like TF serving that you should look into. All right, so that's deploying um, on the web. And what about deploying into hardware? So the core challenge here is that you know, your cell phone does not have the same amount of processing power that you can get on a server. And so you often have to use a bunch of tricks, and Sergey talked about some of them, to reduce the size of your network um, and maybe quantize the weights. Another challenge is that the frameworks that people use on mobile are actually less full featured, and so you might need to choose your model architecture specifically to be one that can run on mobile. Um, there are a few options for doing this in TensorFlow. There's TensorFlow Lite um, and TensorFlow Mobile. And there are also a few um, that are kind of more specific to different hardware platforms. So Apple has a platform, Google has a platform, and then there's this, um, this Fritz option that you know, claims to be able to work well with both. OK, great. That was the lightning five-minute overview of um, Sergey's 90-minute lecture. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, if, were there any questions about the lecture, um, concepts that he covered um, that you would like to talk about? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, Sergey mentioned how uh, like he goes all the way with Docker, where he containerizes each component in his ML code base. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, what benefit does that provide over just containerizing the whole thing? Yeah, I think if you have like different components of a larger system that need to interact with each other, then it could be helpful to just isolate each of them. So they have like sort of a um, a very uh, like small surface area of their API, um, and so you kind of know what to expect from the different components of the system interacting with each other. Um, it could make it easier to test, could make it easier for you know, multiple people on a larger team to work on the different components together and have kind of um, a spec that they need to meet for each other. Other questions? Yeah. From the pipeline that you just showed, from mm -hmm. training to uh, in, in France to uh, serving, which part has been uh, mostly overlooked and like, not taken into account and later on became like, Yeah, um, for, I think for us at OpenAI, I would say, um, and I'm curious what, what Peter thinks about this as well, but um, I feel like training is the one that was overlooked for a long time. Like we would often have, you know, we would really, really push one part of the code base forward, and then we would go back to like some model that we got working months ago, and we and find out that we could no longer train that model. Um, so I think that's one thing that's like really easy to overlook. Other questions on this? Actually, yeah. on what you just said, like when you said you made progress on other part and try to retrain something, mm -hmm. are you saying you were trained another model forward and then you tried to go back to a different model in the same code base or something like that? Is that yeah, so say like um, say you have, you know, two or three tasks that you're working on as a team and you have like a mono repo that you're using for all of them. And you know, you solve the first two of them and your model works really great. Um, and you know you have some you have some weights for those models that you're happy with, um, and then you know most of the team goes and works on the third component. Um, one challenge there is then you know they could push on that third component for two or three months and make some breaking changes to the um, to the training part of the pipeline um, for the first two components without really realizing it. Um, and you know if you're even if you're deploying those the first two components into production or something like that, you still might not notice because. You might, um, you know, the pre-trained model uh, might still be working, but the actual your ability to actually get the loss down on that model 
might have disappeared. Yeah. And then I think like gen more generally, um, outside of the open AI context, um, something that's less of a problem for us, but um, a lot of people complain about when I talk to them is, um, is, monitor is production monitoring. Um, because you know, it's just, it's really, really easy to have like data, data drift or, um, you know, or to have like some sort of like weird input go into your pipeline that you weren't accounting for um, and just break things without even realize that they're realizing that they're breaking. And so I think a lot of teams put a lot of effort into figuring out how to do that really well. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna ask, so when it comes to monitoring, mm -hmm. um, so let's say I'm, I, I, I would like to know if the distribution is skewed where I'm used to one type of images and the users that are requesting are, are getting another source for the images. What sort of metrics can I use to sort of yeah, um, I think Sergey talked about a couple of them in the lecture, um, and this is sort of something that I per, like have done less of personally. But I think you would just want to look at stuff like the statistics of the inputs and outputs. Yeah, you mentioned um, like pixel intensity, but I wasn't sure what that was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just like the value of the pixels, right? Um, and so, I mean, you could imagine doing trickier things too. Like you could look at the um, output distributions of your model, and um, and you could, you know maybe most of the time your model is, produces pretty confident predictions, and if the confidence of your model starts degrading, that might be an early warning that the data distribution is shifting. Um, yeah. But I think like input, um, input and output statistics, so just like you know, over the last n images, um, what have been the sort of the average values of things? Um, and you know, over, the, over the last n like classifications, what have been the classes? What's the distribution of classes that uh, we've looked at? That seems to be the most common thing that people do from talking to people. Yeah. For the context of like NLP distribution, would it be like vocabulary or? Uh, hmm. I yeah. I mean, I think so. Like, if you have, um, you know, if you have like a a character level model, let's say. Um, then you could just look at the distribution of characters. And if that shifts pretty wildly, then you know that like, maybe you're getting sort of a weird type of input into your model, and you should just make sure that the, the distribution isn't very vastly different than what you trained on. Yeah? Any tips and tricks on how to shrink down the package size for Linda? Because it gets pretty big once you get other stuff in there. I guess it's getting too big for Linda. And then uh, uh, for best practice, do you have the model weight sitting somewhere outside of Linda and just have the, I guess, the processes of Linda? Or do you have the model weight inside of Linda? So inside Linda? Yeah, I think, um, and someone else who has sort of done more of this should, try, should chime in. But um, I think what you do, what you, I think you definitely want to have your weights inside of Lambda. Otherwise, you're going to have to call out to something else, and it's going to be really slow. Um, I think like, so there's one bag of tricks, which is like all these, you know, uh, model compression, quantization type things. Um, so that's like how to actually get reduce the, the size, like the um, number of parameters and the, the size of the parameter, uh, the parameter matrices in your model. Um, and then, you know, aside from that, it's like just about minimizing the dependencies that you have, I think. Any, any comments on that? Like any other tips from people who have deployed um, to Lambda? So Sergey mentioned at the end where he removed components, features from TensorFlow that he didn't use, like TensorBoard and Contrib. Mm -hmm. So trying to like have a model that's not using those features and then getting rid of them. When yeah. You're deploying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can you can use more a more stripped down version of TensorFlow. I think that's a really good thing to do as well. Yeah. Um, if I'm monitoring business metrics as well as user feedback. So what are some examples of those that you might monitor? Uh, so for example, if you're predicting, um, like you're doing ads, for example, that click to race, or if you're predicting mm -hmm. text, generating text when the user has to accept or not, then you know, like user, user interaction feedback, are they buying something that you're recommending to them, how, what percentage is buying that, and how it fluctuates? Yep. Yeah, I like that a lot. Monitoring that as well. Then, quick question on is there a standard deployment method for uh, large models uh, where we can just, it's more like the, there's 
this end-to-end -end training systems, but we can train off box off in our, on our own boxes. Mm -hmm. Is that a way to just push those models out and have an API done? Um, so you should look into some of the tools that, that Sergey talked about um, around deploying, um, let's see which slide this was. Um, yeah, so things like TF serving and Clipper, um, if you need to deploy a model that where you need to do inference on GPU. Um, is that getting your question? I'm looking at more of a higher level where I can just like commit to some place or push to some place and... Like press a button and have your model automatically get deployed? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a great question. It seems like something like that should exist. I don't know. I'm curious. Uh, actually, I'm curious. Lucas, have you seen anything like that? That's very popular mm -hmm. that, that has this claim, but I, I haven't used it myself. Uh, but I also wonder, um, I mean, I think the, the, the big deployment problems, I think, are more, that we see is like more of what Josh is talking about versus like actually just practically like moving the, the files around. Like it's, it's so easy to kind of fly the shoot yourself in the foot that I think most people aren't, most people aren't like super worried about like how do I like more easily like copy my File and more kind of like they want to be kind of more safeguards than everywhere else around it. I see. So there's yeah. a business logic around the model that that time. Well, just because it's like, you know, the, I mean, like Josh was saying, just the problem is the models won't give you an error message. They'll just start like, behaving badly. Right. And like every company that I've ever like worked at or, or worked with has like a horror story where they, because I think you might not realize, like, just if you haven't done it, like, you really do end up with a lot of models that have upstream models feeding in data. Because you're like, oh yeah, that spam model would be like so great for my like relevance model. Let me just feed that data in. And then before you know it, you actually have like a hundred other models that are feeding into some like critical model. And it's really where you end up every single time, right? And then, you know, if anybody changes one of those, it can mess up the, the result. I mean, I remember actually, this is like years ago, so I feel like I can say, but I actually remember in, uh, I was working at, at Yahoo Search, which we were deploying machine learning models. At one point, we actually deployed a relevance model that had the, the relevance reversed. <laughs> like, and it was in a, a country that the language was like rare enough that like, you know, there wasn't like a lot of QA and like it was really hard to, it was actually like, I mean, you might think that's like, so blindingly like stupid, but it was actually, you know, it, it was an interaction for like an hour before, you know, the quick metrics cause people to notice that they should really take it out. So it really is like, it might seem dumb if you are like really thinking about it, but you can really get lulled into complacency. Yeah. Um, yeah, another thing that people have talked a lot about, about that seems to really help here is um, like, don't, you know, even if you are pretty confident that your model is going to work well, um, don't just deploy it into production to like start serving predictions right away. Like um, what a lot of companies do is deploy it alongside the, the existing model that they know works okay. And then just sort of keep track of all of that stuff for a while. Um, or maybe even like serve predictions to, you know, 1% of their customers or 10% or something like that. And then sort of only, only over time when you build more confidence that the model is going to work in the real world, then actually make that sort of your main production model. One thing that I'd suggest, uh, I don't know if you looked at, it's core machine learning en engine with, uh, with App Google. And if you just uh, conform to the TF estimator uh, API, then you can, it, it, they try to make it a one click kind of thing. Nice. Do you, do you actually use it? Huh? You, you use that? I, I've gone through like the workshops. Yeah, it's pretty nice. Cool. Cool. Any other thoughts on um, testing, deployment? How many feel like you're going to um, be able to like actually write some unit tests or um, you know regression tests around your code base um, for your project before next week? One, <laughs> two. Well, that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, it's uh. What's that? I don't know. We have a lot. What do you think, Peter? Like, I, I would say we we probably have a, we're trying to we start we just started measuring our coverage like uh, a few weeks back. I think we're at like. 70 percent it's not uh, which is so on the order of hundreds at this point probably yeah the other, the other thing I'll say about this is that like um, you know I think like when I'm writing research code um, I usually will start by not writing any tests um, but I think that one mistake people make is like 
when you're transitioning from research code to code that's like going to be used by a lot of people or deployed into production is like waiting too long to start writing tests. Um, because you know, like the longer time you spend between when you introduce a bug and then when it gets caught, the harder it's going to be to like to go back and find where that bug was and fix it. And this is especially true if there's multiple people working on the code base. Yeah. So the open AI unit test, are those actually unit testing the modules or are they actually unit testing the networks as well? Both, actually. So in some in some cases we uh, you know we would initialize models and stuff like that with random weights and test them in various ways. We also load existing models to make sure and, and stuff like that. Uh, so we try, I think it used to be the case where our unit tests were kind of integration tests, kind of really, they were really integration tests, like, you know, uh, pretending, they were unit tests pretending to be integration tests. Um, and, uh, and and it would be like take a really long time. Like for example, they would actually train a little bit and stuff like that, which is really not a good idea because it ends up if you have hundreds of unit tests, then you have to wait wait for like an hour for all the unit tests to run. So you have to be pretty careful about that. But like ultimately now we're much more in a state of testing modules and test, testing the networks that they're behaving in the way we we expect and stuff. Great. Um, Okay, the, the next thing I want to do is just sort of briefly check in on projects. Um, you know, we have a week left. The, the intention is for everyone to kind of present um, their projects next week and kind of, you know, just, uh, you know, what you tried to do, where you're at, um, and what some of the challenges were. So I just want to get a quick sense, like, how many feel like you have um, kind of a model for your project that, you know, is producing, like, reasonably good results and will be, you know, um, can be, like, kind of a nice graph or some nice outputs to to talk about um, next week. OK, relatively small number. Um, for those of you that are, that are not quite at that stage, what's the main blocker? Is it you, know, you, just, you have sort of a model training, it's just not good enough? Or is it like you're still not able to get data? Training and it's not good enough. Training and it's not good enough? Yeah, data quality wasn't good enough. Yep, that can be a big problem. Other sort of like big challenges that people have run into. Something really slim and simple, like variable and TensorFlow, could be really deployed to a um, kind of use, but it just doesn't work. So something that is more advanced and takes advantage of like Keras, you know, from down in and Keras uh, pre-trained ResNet and things like that. Works way better, mm -hmm. but it's such a pain in the rear to get <laughs> to Lambda. Yeah. Just as, as my team I mentioned, just trimming down the, the freaking image size yep. is just awful. Yeah. Okay, so like models working pretty well, but deployment is also a challenge. Yeah. Yeah, so technical things. Uh-huh. I had the exact same thing about GPT modules. I didn't know if you deployed them. Oh, yeah, don't really. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. And then it, this is related to my question earlier. Like, I yeah. would imagine that there is procedures for these things. Mm -hmm. um, Other sort of big problems that people ran into? <coughs> yeah. Well, you're starting from an existing like, research code base. Mm -hmm. um, figure out where they were defining their architecture and graphics some different architectures and try it and it turned out to be a not working strategy in this particular code base. Interesting. So and why, why was that? Just because the... I think uh, it might just be like um, just sort of like the overall complexity of the and it's like not written in why this particular like, modular, especially <laughs> like there's, there's like a feedback <coughs> because of the particular type of Yeah, so just like, like input output thing. So yeah. the, the short version is that like I I sort of like changed the goal to just get uh, like an implementation from scratch um, working and so I, I'm not so much concerned about like, whether it performs as well as that code base. Yeah. Um, but just have something running. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, yeah, so like working with existing code bases can be really challenging because, you know, as much as we wish this were not true, um, 
a lot of times machine learning researchers, you know, do not write the best, most uh, extendable code. Um, how many people actually like ran into like found bugs in existing code bases that you tried to use? Okay, yeah. How many people like used an existing code base and did not find a bug? All right, zero. All right, yeah. This has been my experience as well. Like I usually, um, I, I mean, it's it's great to be able to start with an existing code base, but I'll almost always end up re-implementing it um, from scratch myself, just because you know I don't generally don't trust random machine learning code that I find on the internet. Um, cool, okay, so um, I think like the, the right way for us to do this next week is, um, you know, we'll have sort of a more detailed um, kind of suggested template for your presentations, but the, um, the, like the, um, the attitude that I want us to have is like, um, let's be, you know, talk about like the, the progress that you made and sort of how well your thing is working, but I wanna be like really upfront about what the big challenges were and try to spend a little bit of time thinking about, like if you're gonna start this project over again from scratch, you know, six, seven weeks ago, um, what would you have done differently now that you know what the challenges that you faced were? Um, you know, choosing a different project, choosing a different data set, different model, because um, I think that'll be really helpful for people to just kind of learn from your experience of what ended up being difficult in your projects. Great, and uh, Stephanie, did you wanna say anything else about the project presentations next week? Um, yeah, I think we covered the key parts. Hopefully you guys give me about just, you know, not having enough for next week or not know what to present on. Um, I just sent something to the Applied Deep Learning channel. Um, it's just a suggested outline that I'll help you guys gain clarity around what to present and how to present next week. Um, it's also just a good reflection because, surprise, it's week seven already, hard to believe. Um, but, yeah, um, if you have any questions, reach out to me or Lucas or Josh. Um, and also, if you answer the questions in, you know, like cut the questions over and then answer them in another doc, you can go in and um, add suggestions and make comments. Um, yeah, I think like a big part of doing all this work is to be able to communicate with people and talk about it. Um, so this will also be good practice. I just have one more thing to add to that. Um, if you plan on projecting your presentation or using the projector, it's easiest if we're presenting from a Mac, just because we use AirPlay to pipe into these monitors. So um, if that is an issue, just let one of us know, and we can try and plan some other way of projecting those. Yeah, that's, a, that's a good point. So slides are probably a good format to do it in. Maybe just send all of them to, if you make slides, send them all to me. You can just use this laptop. Yeah. How much time do we have? Um, five to seven minutes. Okay. Yeah, I think some of the groups have like a live demo, right? First Katie, we're gonna see. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So I know about that group. That group will get like 15 minutes or like 30 minutes, depending on how much fun we're having. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think we should plan for like seven minutes for group. Um, if you need more or but next week should be fun. Great. Um, yeah, that's all for me. It's time for our guest speakers.